Okay, vocal check one, two. Uh, it's uh, just after nine o'clock. Out of respect for everybody's time, I'm going to go ahead and start today's presentation. We got quite a bit to go over. Uh, it's Monday, December the seventh, and we're going to cover chapters nine, ten, and eleven today. This will be our last in-person, uh, not uh, rather our last uh, <clears throat> uh, synchronous session. Uh, Wednesday is the the starting of the uh, final exams, and you get a week from uh, about nine a.m. on this Wednesday to five p.m. on the next Wednesday to take the final exam, and you have to take the course feedback form. Uh, there's a business rule on the Cisco Neticad site. You have to take the course feedback form before you can take the final exam. That's an anonymous form. I can't see what anybody in particular said. I just get to see a conglomerate, similar to the uh, student satisfaction survey we have on WebAdvisor that you can also take if you want to, but this course feedback you must take you know, to take the final exam. <clears throat> that date on Wednesday, December the 16th at 5 p.m. is the final deadline for turning in all work. I don't count off for any late work, but you have to have it in by that time because I have to turn my grades in uh, to the dean. The last lab is 10.2.2.9. is a Windows lab. You can do it on a Windows computer, or you can use the student VDI workspace, student workspace on the VDI and my TCC to complete that lab as well. Okay, let's see now. I'm going to go ahead and switch to the first slideshow. <clears throat> and this first chapter is covering uh, the transport layer. We talked about how we've been working our way up the layers uh, from the physical data link layer, network layer, and now we're at the transport layer. In the uh, TCP IP model, it's the data, uh, network access layer is a sort of a combination of the physical and data link layer. In the TCP IP model, we call it internet instead of network. But these two names at the transport are the name of both in them. So all the layers below didn't have any uh, positive acknowledgement and retransmission. They couldn't catch errors and correct errors. And the transport layer does all that stuff for us. <coughs> OK, let's see. So which slide, get going here. So transport layer is, um, he talks about establishing a session between two applications and delivering a data between them. So computers don't have infinite capacity. They're going to start a little temporary session when you click on a web page. They'll send the part, the pieces of the web page to you, and then they'll disconnect the session. This is similar in concept to the phone company that doesn't have infinite dial tone to give every phone in the whole city. So if you take your phone off the hook and don't dial anything after a few seconds, they'll take away your dial tone because they only have a certain amount to give to other people because they have limited processing capability. So in the graphic on the right, we see that the uh, transport layer uh, accepts data from the application layer and begins to prepare it to be on the network. He, he adds a transport layer header with port numbers and then gives that down to the internet layer. He puts it in a network packet and then the network layer adds it, uh, passes it down to the network access layer like an ethernet adapter. And he would put it in the ethernet frame and shoot the bits out over the wire. So here are some responsibilities. We want to track the conversation, the individual conversation. You could run multiple applications on your Windows or Mac OS X or Linux machine. And one of the things that the transport layer does is keep track of these and keep them individual from each other so that you don't want uh, contaminated data from one web browser to end up in an email inbox. It keeps those things all separate from each other using this concept of, of you know, unique port numbers on each computer. He, the transport layer, when he accepts that long stream of data from the application layer, he segments it into data. He's going to assign sequence and acknowledgement numbers to them so they can be put back together in the right order if they happen to be received out of order. If anything is missing, they can just send the missing segment. They don't have to send the whole stream of data all over again. And by identifying each application, we're going to make sure that each application goes to the correct window on that Windows desktop machine so you see the right data in the right window. Uh, multiplexing is we're going to mix together lots of different conversations over the same wire on the same network. So you could be running uh, two web browsers on your computer and maybe printing to a Microsoft Word document to a printer and maybe running an email program all at the same time. So this allows all these to share that same network wire that comes out of your individual PC as well as share with all the other devices that you're plugged into on that particular network. 
So there's two different choices that we can use at the transport layer. Uh, for positive acknowledgement and retransmission and very reliable, we're going to use TCP. This is going to do all this is going to do all the stuff for us so we don't have to put it in our individual applications. It'll do the reliable uh, uh, reliable uh, uh, transport of information. It'll sequence them, open them back to the event to right order. It does make the header a little bit bigger and it does add a little bit of overhead because there's a lot of checking for errors. If we no, normally we want this reliability. So for most applications, we use it. Now, a few things we don't need this reliability because it's a short, quick, and dirty message. Like, for example, a DNS request that says, tell me what the netacad.com IP address is so I can put it in the packet. So it's faster than TCP. So T uh, T UDP is typically used for DNS uh, uh, requests to look up a number for me. And maybe the TFTP that we would use for backing up and saving the uh, startup configuration file from the device. TCP is like when you send a FedEx package and the package was too big to be sent in one box, I could put it in several boxes and, and FedEx is going to track them. So I can check to see if they've been delivered and then I can put all the packages back together and assemble my device that was sent in all these different packages. So we can segment our data. In this uh, case, the graphic we're showing that the data has been sent into six segments. And then as it goes from one ISP to the other ISP, it'll, put back, it'll be put back together on that server at the ISP and it'll be able to receive that data in one cohesive chunk. It'll put it back together just like it was originally sent. So TCP has a thing called positive acknowledgement and retransmission, which means that we break the data into segments. We send a chunk of data segment to the receiving device, and he sends back an acknowledgement message that he got. He got some of that stuff okay, and it's okay to send the next part of it. If the receiving host machine fails to acknowledge, the sending workstation will automatically just send another copy of it out. So here's the big three responsibilities. Uh, TCP is going to is going to number um, sequence and acknowledgement numbers, track the data segments. He'll acknowledge the received data, and if any errors occur, if any data gets dropped, uh, if he doesn't get an acknowledgement, the, the sending workstation will simply send another copy of the data he never got acknowledged, and it will be sent. And eventually, all the data will be sent uh, to the receiving workstation. Then the receiving workstation will look at those sequence acknowledgement numbers and put the data back in the correct order. It is possible for data to be received out of order. He'll, he'll compensate for that and we'll get the good pristine copy of the data that we transmitted. Now UDP has less overhead. It doesn't have all these features. It doesn't do any acknowledgement. It's uh, unreliable. He says in the graphic, it's similar to sending a letter in the mail. I'll never know the letter is coming. I can't track it. I'll never know about it till I get it. The sender of the letter will never know if the receiver got it okay. So UDP is like sending a postcard in the mail. TCP is like sending a FedEx package and we can track it and we can prove that it was received okay. So different applications, when we're sending computer files, uh, uh, Windows service packs, things of that nature, it's got to be absolutely perfect. Any one bit being messed up could erase the hard drive. So for things of sending email messages, sending uh, web browser traffic, sending files back and forth, databases. We want to make sure it's totally accurate down to the last bit. Now, UDP, because of all this extra overhead that TCP requires to check this stuff, this falls down if we try to use this for streaming audio or video or IP tele telephone services. Um, it would add too much overhead. It would be unusable. And if one or two pieces of a live video stream get messed up, it may not even be noticeable to the user. So it's much more efficient for things like streaming audio and streaming video and telephones. But we're going to use TCP for most other stuff that we need to have perfect, perfect data transmission for place. <clears throat> TCP has a procedure for establishing a session between two host machines, connection-oriented protocol. Uh, they're going to send out a sync, sync act, act stream to make sure that both workstations are ready to be able, host machines are ready to send information back and forth to them. And at this time, they'll also figure out how much traffic they, they can send in one chunk. 
I think about Amazon.com web server on Prime Day. It's really, really, really busy. He's not willing to accept a whole bunch of data in one chunk from you. So he'll tell you that you need to slow down and send it more slowly. He's going to get to you, but he has a million other people connected to him right now. So he's got to slow each individual person down. The reliable delivery, delivery I call this PAR, positive acknowledgement retransmission. We're going to make sure that every segment of data that the source machine sends will be arrived at the des destination because the destination is going to confirm that back to me. Um, he's going to tell me that he got it. Okay, if he fails to tell me, I'll just retransmit the data. Uh, the sequencing numbering system that's in TCP will number all the segments. And so if they happen to be received out of order, they can put them back in the right order. And then the flow control is the method that says how much can the source data, source machine transmit at one particular time. I can open and close, a, we call it a sliding window, and, and tell the transmitting machine to slow down or speed up as the conditions permit. So this is the TCP header. The source and destination ports are used. Pencil, please. The source and destination ports are used to identify the application. This is a 16-bit value. Now, I've talked in here before about the well-known port for a oh, web is port 80. So if you're trying to attract the attention of a server at your company to get to the website to see how much vacation time you've got left in human resources, uh, that server may also be running email. It may also be running DNS. It may also be running DHCP. We wish to attract the attention of the, of the uh, HTTP server, the web server that's on that machine so we can log into it and check our vacation time. So the well-known port for that is port number 80. So I would put the destination port of 80 when I created, when my machine created the packet, the, the web browser to send this information, created the segment, you would pour, put or, port 80 in there. Uh, the sequence number is used, sequence and acknowledgement numbers are used to keep track of the data. There are 32-bit 30 32 numbers, so that's like 4 billion different combinations. And when I send a sequence number and transmit data to a receiving host, it will keep that, use that sequence and acknowledgement numbers to keep track to make sure that all this data might, it might be 10 gigabytes of data if it's a Windows 10 service pack, for example. Make sure that all this data is put back in the right order. The header length is the length of the TCP header itself. The control bits are used, <clears throat> such as SYNC, SYNC, ACK, and ACK. These bits are used to uh, control uh, uh, setting up the circuit setting up the uh, 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 flow of data and controlling when the data can be disconnected. The window size is how much data am I willing to accept at one time? So if I'm the Amazon Prime server, I need to slow down and tell you the slow, not, I can't take so much data from you because it's Prime Day and there's thousands of other people waiting to connect at the same time. Then there's a checksum for checking for errors. So UDP is, we use this for streaming audio, streaming video, uh, uh, Cisco telephone stuff, because uh, we simply, if we put the TCP overhead on there, it would become unusable. I couldn't send streaming YouTube video if we had the TCP positive acknowledgement and retransmission for each little segment of data for every video frame they were sending out. So we're going to tolerate small amounts of losses. So you might see a sprinkle in the video. You might hear a little artifact in the audio. Uh, telephones are typically lousy quality anyway. People are used to them being very lo-fi. So uh, data is simply put back together in the order it's received. Any segment that's lost is not resent. There, there's no additional overhead of establishing the session in the first place. So it's perfect for things like streaming audio and streaming video where we want very high efficiency. No tracking as a stateless protocol. If we need any reliability, the application would have to do that. An example would be the TFTP protocol, which we use to back up the Cisco iOS or the Cisco startup config to a TFTP server. The TFTP application itself handles the uh, uh, making sure that lost data is retransmitted. If a data, uh, uh, if most people that want, most of the time when you run an application, you need reliability, you're going to use TCP because it'll handle that for you, and you won't have to reinvent the wheel and put that in your application program itself. So this port number scheme means that one PC can be running, in this case, three applications at the same time. He's running an email program. He's running a web browser program. He's running an internet chat program. And this will separate the data because this PC only has one IP address. 
Helium has one physical MAC address, but this port number feature allows all these different applications to run at the same time on the PC and not get their data mixed up or commingled with each other because they'll use these source and destination port numbers to keep them separate. The port 80 stuff goes into the email, goes into the goes into the web browser screen. The internet chat goes on the internet chat screen. The email ends up in the email application device. So that keeps stuff separate because we only have one physical MAC address. We only have one physical logical IP address. The source port is the port that the sending device, a client machine, dynamically generates. The destination port is designed to attract the attention of the particular service that's running on that server. Uh, example, port 80. If you want to attract the attention of the web server, you have to make the destination port in your request port 80. If you wanted to attract the attention of the email uh, 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 Outlook program to send an email to the boss, you'd use port 110 or port 25. Internet chat is port 531. It's a it's a 16 bit value. So there's 65,000 possible combinations here, and there's no PC in the world, Windows PC, that can run more than 10 applications at the same time without crashing. So that's plenty of numbers for us. So if we look at this complete encapsulation, uh, we have a PC that's running both an FTP server, he's running an FTP file transfer program, and he's running a web program. So when we look at the, this one is the FTP transfer program. Well, the well-known port number for FTP is port 20 and 21. So the upper layer of data, this chunk of, e, of uh, uh, FTP file transfer traffic, this is upper user data. And then we have our source and destination IP addresses that match our source machine and destination machine. They are physical MAC addresses. This is an entire Ethernet frame shown here with the upper layer encapsulated data. So when you look at that combination of the layer three MAC address, I mean the layer three uh, IP address and the layer four port number, that's called a socket. This 192.168.1.7 is the uh, IP address of the server, and dot 80, colon 80 means we need to track the attention of the web browser server, I mean the web uh, server uh, service that's running on that particular device. So this allows multiple devices, multiple processes to be told from each other. This server only has one IP address. He only has one MAC address. So how does he distinguish an FTP incoming data from a web incoming data? He uses the port numbers to do this. And then when the information is sent back to, to the client machine that requested it, uh, he will flip those numbers and the web server will attract the attention of the destination port of that client machine. The ephemeral, uh, dynamically generated port, servers source information on low numbers below 1,000. So example, port 25, email, uh, port 80, web traffic. Client machines that are not servers use numbers above 1,000. So they dynamically make up, in the case of the FTP, he just made up a number that he hadn't used at 1305, and he made up the number 1099 for the web connection. So these are all unique numbers, and that means the information won't get mixed up between the server and between the client machines that request it as they go back and forth. So well-known ports, 0 to 1,023. These are for servers, services running on servers. The numbers between 1,000 and 49,000 are called registered ports. And uh, Windows machines, of course, don't want to follow the rules. So they use these for their dynamically generated port numbers. They usually start with 1,024 and go on up. So you're supposed to use 49,000 to 65,000. Uh, but depending on the operating system, you can use any of these numbers above 1,000 if you're a client. If you're a server, you can use one of the numbers below 1,000, like 80 if you're a web server, or 25 if you're an email server. So here are some well-known port numbers for some various um, uh, ap uh, application protocols that run on different machines. Uh, FTP is a very old protocol. It's just for transferring files. It was a predecessor to web, H HTML, HTTP. It uses one channel for the transferring of the data, and another channel as a sort of a command and control channel. Most other protocols seem to be able to exist pretty well on just one port number. So tell that's port 23. Uh, transmitting emails, port 25, web traffic is port 80, and so forth. 
a utility that can check of your that you can run on your desktop machine, your client machine, to see what what connections are taking place right now. You can type the netstat command at the DOS prompt, at the command prompt, and he'll show you um, all the connections that are taking place right now. So uh, we can use the dash n option if we want to also display the port numbers in numerical form instead of uh, uh, the DNS lookup value. Okay, let's look at the TCP server process. The client is sending TCP requests to client machines. These two client machines are sending TB TCP requests to this top server at the top of the triangle. Uh, port 80 is the one on port for web. Port 25 is the one on port for mail, transmitting mail. So the first client is going to send that destination port. He's going to set the destination port to port 80. He, he wants to get in touch with the web server. Client 2 is going to set his destination port to port 25 to attract the attention of the uh, email transmission servers like Microsoft App uh, or Eudora, whatever email program is running on that particular machine. So well-known ports are used as a destination port. And then when the server, um, uh, when the server sends something back, uh, he will flip those numbers back and forth. So the destination port will be swapped between the server and the client, just like he flips the MAC addresses and he flips the IP addresses. So when the answer comes back, the server is responding to the client one, that was a web, and client two, that was an email. And the port numbers are flipped. So the destination port, uh, uh, the destination port is now that dynamically generated high port number on client one and that dynamically generated port number on client two. And again, that socket connection, the IP address, the unique IP address on each host machine, colon, the port numbers, make sure this is all unique and it won't be mixed up by routers that are doing network address translation or servers or clients that are talking to each other. So a pretty cool system that keeps things straight. Now let's look at this sync, sync, act, sync, 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 act, act. Uh, I'm a workstation A and I'm trying to connect to a workstation B to send them a file. You may be using Microsoft file sharing. So the first thing I send that is a sync. This is one of those control bits in the header of the TCP. And I tell him what is my initial sequence number so that he knows what my number that I'm counting from is. So that's sent to B. Step two, the workstation B is going to send back sync ACK, and he's going to tell me what his sequence number is. And he will acknowledge that my initial sequence number was 100 by telling me I acknowledge that the next one is going to be 101. So sync ACK. And then finally, the initial client machine sends back ACK machine, sends that back of ACK. He increments his sequence number to 101, and he acknowledges that that sequence number that was sent back by the other machine, 300, he sets this back to 301, acknowledging that I got 300, I expect 301 next. This is, no data has been transmitted. This is just setting up the communication channel to make sure that both hosts A and B are willing and ready and able to send data back and forth to each other. And uh, now they'll proceed to where they can actually send data and acknowledge data. Oh, well, now let's skip to the ending. When we have finished transmitting the data, like the phones have, the telephones exchanges have a limited amount of dial tone. Um, we're gonna we're gonna tear down the session. Fin act fin act. So workstation A is gonna send the fin. Workstation B will send back acknowledge. Workstation two will send the fin. Workstation one will send the acknowledge, and the phones are hung up. The transmission is is completed. They can't leave you can't connect it continuously because servers have a limited amount of processing power, and they can't leave ten thousand people connected just because they're they're fell asleep browsing a web page and they and they still haven't gone to the next page. So the three-way handshake is done with these control bits. Sync, sync, act, act. There's a re reset or restart flag when an error timeout occurs. Uh, there's an urgent flag. Sounds like a foreigner song. Urgent, urgent. Uh, so uh, normally only a few of these are set at the same time. Now the hack hackers use a Christmas tree light attack, and they light up all six of these control bits at the same time to try to crash the operating system and do a buffer overflow and get into them. Normally, only one or two of them are set at a time. TCP reliability is this ordered delivery in that um, we're going to set up the, um, 
initial sequence numbers and the initial acknowledgement numbers so that we can agree to count them it, uh, in the same progress. So the data is divided, in this case, the data is divided into six segments. And because they went through different routes and a, a multi-protocol router thing here, they didn't arrive at in order. They arrived out of order. But the TCP code will automatically look at the sequence numbers and the acknowledgement numbers and put them back in the right order. So our original data is restored, an exact copy of our original data that we sent. So even if it's received out of order, they can be put back in order. If a segment is never received, it will be retransmitted and the receiving workstation can put the data all back in the right order. So flow control is how much data am I willing to send at one time? During the initial three-way handshake, um, they agree upon what their, what their uh, size, the window size should be. So in this case, they decided that uh, the window size is going to be 10,000. That means I will, I can send or receive 10,000 bytes of data, octets of data, and then I'll wait for you to acknowledge it, and then I'll send the rest. So the window size, how many bytes can be sent before I need an acknowledgement back? And the acknowledgement number is the number of the next expected byte. So this is this mechanism to make sure that if any data is lost, it will be retransmitted and everything is put back together in the right order. Now, what if there's congestion? Um, workstation A is transmitting data, and he doesn't get back an acknowledgement of the second and third seg second segment two and three. He only got back one and two. So if data is retransmitted, that can cause congestion to be worse. So TCP flow control will close the sliding window and reduce the size of data that can be transmitted in one chunk in an effort to sort of you know, get around the problem of uh, noise uh, on the data line. UDP is low overhead, uh, but not reliable. No establishing connection for sending the data. Uh, it's like if I put a postcard in the mail, I can have no guarantees that you will get it. You'll never know it's coming till you get it. I'll never know if you received it. So if I need any of those acknowledgement or error checking, I have to put them into my application program. So good for streaming audio, streaming video, where a little loss of data is okay or a UDP uh, 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 DNS request to the DNS server, quick tell me the 32-bit IP address of cisco.com. And that can usually get in between the errors and I've received it, okay. UDP um, uh, simply puts the data back in the order it was received. Out of data orders are not reordered. So if it's streaming audio or streaming video, you might hear artifacts on the audio. You might see garbage in the video. Think of the YouTube scrolling symbol, buffering symbol. It's up to the applications to identify the proper sequence if they need to do something with it, like TFTP. He has his own built-in code to put stuff back in the right order. But overall, UDP itself is connectionless, and he is unreliable. OK, the remote authentication dialing user service radio server is something that is typically used with um, um, servers and Cisco router and network routers and switches so that instead of putting our password, Cisco login commands on each individual device, we can have our uh, master server, the radio server has the list of everybody's proper name and password and each device will check with it when they log into it. So in this case, the client machine has asked the server to uh, give him some, provide some service and to authenticate him, the server connects to the, to the uh, 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 radius device, and he verifies that the name and password are proper, and then gives it access. This is real similar to what we use in our person-to-person -person lab on South Campus. When you log into your computer, your password is not stored on that computer. It's stored on a Microsoft uh, Active Directory Domain Services computer. And then the domain service computer checks your password. It's encrypted, so no one can use Wireshark and see your password. And then he sends a message back to your workstation and says, he must have put in the right password. Let him log into that desktop computer. Uh, UDP is the feature that um, uh, when we request the 
destination ports, we want to attract the attention of the, here's a server, and he's running both the DNS service, and he's running the radius authentication service. So client number one is making a request to look up a DNS value. I'm giving you a, you know, uh, humanresources.com, you're supposed to translate to the real IP address. Client two is trying to log into a network device, so he's asking the server to verify that the Cisco class password is proper. The ports that are requested, the source ports each machine makes up is a high number of values. Should be above 49,000, but Microsoft machines don't like to follow the rules. They'll typically use a number above 1,024. But no client machines will ever use a number below 1,024 because only servers can do that. The well-known, all, all those numbers are reserved for real things that a, uh, a data center server would run, like web services, DNS services, et cetera. So clients are sending the UDP request and the port numbers, individual port numbers, will make sure that when he sends the answer back, it will get to the right machine and the, 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 the client one, client two computers will look at that source and destination for it and realize that's the, that's the uh, answer they asked for and they'll process the data properly. Yeah, nothing confusing about that. So applications that we need reliability from, uh, web, file transfer, a simple mail transfer protocol, uh, Telnet features. We don't have to build in the lines of code in those individual application layer protocols. We're going to see application layer protocols in another chapter today. So TCP is like, uh, I don't have to reinvent this reliability wheel for each application that I'm running. TCP will do it for me. So most applications that need reliability use TCP to do that for them. So UDP is, if I don't need the reliability, I'm willing to tolerate a little bit of errors, like streaming audio, streaming video with a few artifacts or a few sprinkles on the screen. Uh, if I tried to use the TCP reliability, it would cost me too much overhead. So uh, uh, things like a DNS request, uh, DHCP request to get an IP address from the server, uh, simple network management protocol, uh, anything that's streaming audio and streaming video, just a simple quick request, reply, reply, request and reply they will handle their own reliability. So for example, if you talk to your DNS server and say, quick, tell me the address of netacad.com and you don't get an answer back, you'll just try again in a few seconds and see if you can get the answer the second time. Okay, now let's go back to here and go back to here. Are we still taking good? And we're gonna share the files and we're gonna share this file. And now it's time for application layer stuff. Okay. So application layer protocols, when we look at our TCP IP model, the application layer is the entire top three layers of the dreaded Fairbit Hayden OSI seven layer reference model. So we finished the transport layer, transport to transport one to one alignment. In the uh, application model, this is what this is the layer where application programs use an application layer protocol to get access to the network. They begin to prepare the information to be processed by the network. So typical application layer protocols are things like DNS, look up the IP address of Cisco.com. Hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP for web traffic, simple mail transfer protocol. It listed some application layer protocols here that, that need to get processed and managed to be uh, uh, Fix so they can go into the network wire and become bits, go through all the seven layers. Now, presentation layer, session layer, very little focus at the CCNA. Um, presentation layer is anything having to do with, for example, we use the ASCII character code for letters of the alphabet for email. If we're doing any type of data compression like WinZip, that's presentation layer. If we're doing any type of encryption of data, encryption and decryption of data, that's considered a presentation layer process. The session layer is establishing unique sessions between client machines and server machines and keep tracking track of the sessions that are going on with them. So when you log into, when you log into the Microsoft desktop machine in the computer lab, you establish a session, the server message block is the Microsoft session layer protocol. It gives you, you put in the right name and the right password, and now you can print to the printer. Now you can go and, and copy a file and send it to the printer and things of that nature. 
So at the presentation layer, we might be concerned about things such as, well, how would I represent a video file, MPEG? How would I represent a video file, JPEG or GIF or PNG? Those are the how data is represented as cost classification layer. Now let's look at some application layer protocols. DNS is uh, our server, our service that um, if you type in a name, we, we can't expect our users to type in the 32-bit IP version 4 address or the 128-bit IP version 6 address to get to a server. They won't tolerate binary numbers. They want to type hr.com or they want to type microsoft.com and the DNS will take that microsoft.com and look up the actual 32-bit IP address and give that back to your machine so you can create a packet with the proper binary address in, in it. Telnet is a um, emulation program that we use. Uh, we use Telnet, for example, to connect to a uh, Cisco router or a switch that's already been configured and has an IP address. We can do it remotely. Uh, bootstrap protocol and DHCP. Um, bootstrap protocol was an early version of DHCP that obtained gave network addresses to client machines. DHCP was a great improvement that came about in the mid 90s, which I adopted immediately because I used to have to statically configure hundreds of workstations and it was a big drag. It wouldn't it be nicer. Computers love to keep track of numbers. We use DHCP for this. Universally at home, your home router uses DHCP and then this is use this. Hypertext transfer protocol is another application layer protocol. That's the, the engine of the internet. FTP file transfer protocol is used for uh, transferring files back and forth. This is the way we transferred files before we got the web. TFTP is a stripped down version that uses UDP instead of TCP. So a quick and dirty backing up of a startup configuration file, for example, from a switch or a router, we use this. Simple mail transfer protocol is the mechanism that uses port 25 to transmit the mail. When you click the send button, this is what's happening. Post office protocol is used to pick up your mail or IMAP. Uh, po post office protocol and IMAP are protocols for retrieving the email. Now, you probably aren't using these last two much anymore because you're probably using a, a web-based email client like, uh, like Google Mail or Yahoo Mail or Microsoft Hotmail. They do all this stuff behind the scenes and they just send you web pages. Peer-to-peer -peer networking is um, peer two has got the printer attached to it. The directly connected printer plugs right into the USB port of peer two. And peer one is using peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, file and print sharing using Microsoft. I want to print to that device. So in the peer-to-peer -peer network, there's no dedicated server. There's no server administrator that resets passwords. So this is very, uh, this is okay for about 10 to 15, a company with about 10 to 15 devices. Uh, if you need to know the password, it'll be on a sticky note above the coffee machine in the break room because there's no security. Or if the guy at Pier 2 gets mad at the guy on Pier 1, he'll change the printer password he won't tell it to him. So there's no centralized security here, no centralized administration. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer messages, uh, like a chat machine, a chat, a chat program, you, they're both equal with each other. Peers are the same status as each other. They're considered equal in the communication process. Uh, Peer-to-peer -peer, uh, a bit torrent is, uh, for example, think of the Pirate Bay website where uh, they don't store the files, you know, the movies, the CDs, the, the uh, uh, application programs that you're supposed to pay for. Uh, they don't store them. They're stored on individual users' machines. So uh, bit torrent is the, 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 if you need to download a file and you're getting it from someone in Sweden or Denmark, they'll each give you little pieces of it from all around the world. And there's no centralized server for them to shut down. Like originally when they had, oh, I forget what it was called. It was a CD music sharing thing, Napster. Uh, and the authorities were able to shut the Napster servers down because they had the illegal copies of the music stored on the central server. They could hunt that server down and, uh, and they could confiscate it. But peer-to-peer uh, -peer applications like BitTorrent, there's no one person to hunt down. They're stored between these billions of users all around the world. Now there are legitimate uses for BitTorrent as well, like Linux distributions and things of that nature. In a client server model, and our company is more than 10 or 15 people. We can't use the Microsoft peer-to-peer, -peer, there's no security. We have hundreds of employees. So well, we have 
the, the college has got like four or five thousand employees, a hundred thousand students. So we're going to store everything on server machines. We have a big data server center downtown that stores all our information. So on the client server model, clients request services and servers fulfill these requests for services. So all the resources are stored on the server machine, like say the web advisor server stores your grades and your schedule for the next semester. And then the client is a <clears throat> something you use directly, like a desktop machine or a, a program, like there's a, there's a student version of Blackboard that you can run on your on your cell phone. And you can connect to the to the Blackboard server and see stuff on it. So if I want to upload something, I upload it from the client machine to the server machine. If I want to download it, I download it from the server machine to the client machine. So some well-known application protocols. Let's look at this. Hypertext transfer protocol. Simple mail transfer protocol to send mail and post office protocol to pick those up. I think we got a separate page for these. Okay, so hypertext transfer protocol is this protocol that allows us to uh, uh, go to a web page and, and dig down into the web and find the page we need to go to. So the, our uniform resource locator, our URL, we have the HTTP or if it's secure, it's HTTPS. <coughs> This is the protocol. You could type FTP call it and go to an FTP server. Uh, the server name is uh, www.cisco.com. And by default, this index.html file, if you just type www.cisco.com, you'll get their, their first page, their, their uh, splash pages you get when you log into their website, index.html. If you want to go to a specific page, you would type that page name instead of index.html. So the first thing that happens is your browser checks with a DNS server and converts www.cisco.com into a numeric IP address. Then using the hypertext transfer protocol, he sends a git. Git me the index.html file. Or I can say git by itself, I'll get the default file. Sometimes called index, uh, sometimes called another thing. The server will respond and send back the HTML code for that particular web page, and the browser will show that. And the whole idea of web browsers and HTML was no matter what kind of hardware you're using, it'll look pretty, pretty much the same when you look at it. So hypertext transfer protocol and secure, this is how we publish and retrieve web pages. So there's a specific get request, post request, put request. If you fill out a web form, um, um, you can uh, go to a web page and they'll say, well, uh, fill out this web form and put in your email address and we'll send you some information. Then those can be um, <laughs> processed by the web server and they'll send it usually to a database server. Simple mail transfer protocol, post office protocol, IMAP. SMTP is for sending mail. So this is, it's not very common these days for people to run the old traditional email programs. They typically would run Google Mail or Hotmail or Yahoo Mail. And then these protocols will be used by the Yahoo server at their data center. But maybe you're running, maybe you work for a company and you're using Outlook or Outlook Express on your desktop PC to communicate with the Exchange server for the uh, company. They would use these protocols. So when I click the send button, I'm using simple mail transfer protocol call to start this process of relaying my email to the server and to the recipient. When I check my inbox to pick up the mail, I'm receiving POP or IMAP. POP is the earlier, more primitive one. IMAP has better graphics and attachment features. So most email clients provide all these protocols within one particular application program, like Microsoft Outlook or Microsoft Outlook Express, if you use that. So in this graphic, we have an example of a, you're sending an email. Maybe you are a uh, cable company user. And you're sending something to an email to someone who is a telephone company DSL customer. So you sit, you hit, you do the transmit button. Am I right? Okay, you hit the transmit button. It goes to your internet connection. Goes to the cable company's mail server. And they say, well, this is not another cable company customer, and this is a customer at some other 
company like the telephone company. So he'll send simple mail transfer product, he'll send it to the telephone company server. <coughs> Pardon me. Then the, then the telephone company server will send it to, to your internet connection and you'll be able to pick it up in your email receiving program that you use. So simple mail transfer protocol is transfers mail, which when you click send, a message has to have a certain formatting. So your email program will handle this, or if you're using Google Mail or Yahoo Mail or Hotmail, they will process this properly for you. So the simple mail transfer protocol process must be running on both the client machine, your program running, say, Outlook Express, and on the server machine of your ISP that receives it. So port 25 is used to transfer this mail. Post office protocol is what we use. Well, hardly anybody uses these anymore because they're using an email based, they're using a web based email service. But if you're running a program like Microsoft Outlook, you would use port 110 to pick up your mail. And when you pick up your mail with POP, it's not stored on the server because the server has limited hard drive space. Well, many years ago, this is a joke because today we have huge hard drives for almost no money at all. But POP doesn't store messages. So cable companies like this because they don't have to store everybody's email on it. It's, Store it on your desktop PC when you receive an email. So a mail user agent sends the email. You're running Outlook and you transmit the email to your boss. The mail transfer agent is that computer running uh, uh, Microsoft Exchange, the mail server. And it'll check to see, oh, is this another person at my company or is this a person at some other company? In this case, no, it's a person at a different company. He will send that to that company's mail transfer agent and he will process it and send it to that employee of another company. So the mail transfer agent service handled this process for you. Message delivery agent is the one that actually delivers it. So when you pick up mail from your cable company, the message delivery agent at your cable company waits for you to log on and then sends you your cable mail. Mail delivery agents accept a piece of mail from a mail transfer agent and they do the actual delivery. They receive all the inbound mail, they put it in the mailboxes. And they can also be programmed to do things like check for viruses or prohibited emails or, or in these days we have to worry about ransomware attempts and if there's any return receipt stuff. Simple mail transfer protocol simply, you click send, you transfer the email. Post office protocol picks it up, deletes it from the server. IMAP picks it up but saves it on the server so you can log into a second machine, your mail is still there. Okay, DNS is our feature that makes a human readable name. What is the actual indecipherable binary 32 bits or 128 bits? <clears throat> so uh, Cisco.com is easy for people to use. So when I type Cisco.com into my web browser, the packet that's sent out by my machine out the back this is say Cisco.com. It's got to be resolved into the binary address that corresponds to Cisco.com. So my client machine will make a request. He will ask his DNS server, what's the numerical equivalent of Cisco.com? And in this case of this graphic, Cisco.com was resolved into this 198, that 133, that 219, that 25, the dotted decimal equivalent of our 32-bit binary address. And then the client machine can create a packet and put that destination address in it and we can log on to the Cisco website. Okay, in step five, the DNS address has been resolved and I can create that packet and actually connect to that device. So DNS message formats, a A record is an end device address, like Cisco.com is the 198. whatever that number was. And NS is a name server, another DNS server. Canonical name or C name is like the alias for a name. And then the MX is if it's a mail server, a mail exchange record that works with mail servers. Now, if a particular DNS server is unable to resolve the name using what records he has, he will contact a more authoritative server upstairs and ask him to do that form and update him. <clears throat> so servers temporarily store this, re this re relationship, this correlation between IP address and domain name, and they keep it for about an hour. I can go to my Windows computer and type IP config, display DNS, and see all the DNS requests that I've made recently. 
So here is an example of hierarchy of DNS servers. I'm a DNS client. I'm the low man on the totem pole. My company, ISP, or my company has a local DNS server. He has the records for mail.cisco and www.cisco.com. And then we have some top level servers, all the comms, all the orgs. And there's, um, I think there's about 17 root DNS servers geographically dispersed throughout the world. So in case there's a tsunami or something, we're not out of action. And any DNS process on a low level machine can just, if he can't resolve it, he'll keep going upstairs until he gets an answer and then he'll update his own records. NS lookup is a command prompt, DOS prompt command you can run that will allow you to check, check the DNS service. You can do what your web browser is doing. You can type NS lookup and then type www.cisco.com and it tells you what the IP address is. If you type netacad, uh, uh, this is an old graphic, so cisco.netacad.net. That was the old address we used to go to the network academy. Now it's netacad.com. And you can look up this correlation between any particular arbitrary uh, uh, web name, English name, and this actual physical IP address. <clears throat> okay, DHCP is what we use today because it's uh, stati setting static addresses for PCs is just too much of a drag. So when a workstation boots up, this is one of the biggest sources of broadcast on the network is when everybody boots up their workstation in the morning. The workstation will send out a broadcast message saying, please hook me up with a good IP address that works and is not a duplicate. So the DHCP server has got, instead of me running around with an Excel spreadsheet and statically configuring people like I used to have to do in the 80,000 square feet when I was downtown at Harcourt, the DHCP server has a list of addresses that he has that are available and which have already been leased out or been utilized. And whenever you make a broadcast request, he'll give you an IP address you can use for the next day or three weeks. So this is used for desktop PCs, employee PCs, uh, telephones, uh, tablets, uh, laptop computers. Typically, we don't use this for network devices like servers and printers, uh, uh, routers, switches, things of that nature. So in our uh, laboratory classroom, all the desktop, comp uh, uh, all the desktop computers give DHCP dynamic addresses. The printer that's in the back of the room, he has a static address. So we're going to set up a DHCP server at each particular location. You're at home. Your home router is a DHCP server. And all your Wi-Fi attached devices, all your plugged in devices will get a valid legitimate address to use from that DHCP server. In a corporate environment, we're still going to use DHCP. So uh, uh, TCC is a big organization. We have our own DHCP servers that give addresses to all the campus's devices. This is the DORA, this, uh, this uh, DORA the Explorer, discover, offer, request, and acknowledge. So what happens if the DHCP client first sends out a broadcast discover? I'm trying to discover a DHCP server. There could be more than one. Microsoft recommends at least two in their networks because Microsoft servers crash a lot. You need to have at least running, at least one running. So the DHCP clients send this out in the form of a broadcast because they don't have their numbers yet. They don't have the network numbers. They have to broadcast everything. The DHCP server will send back an offer saying, I'm a server and I have an available address and you can use it. If there's two or more of them, two offers will be sent to the client. The client will choose one and send the request back to that server. In the case of this case, there's just one saying, okay, I'll, I'll take your offer. And at that point, the server sends back the acknowledgement, and the DHCP client now has a valid IP address and subnet mask and default gateway and DNS server value, and he can start to use on the network. And this takes a couple seconds to do this. Okay, file transfer protocol. File transfer between a client and a server. Uh, what we used to use a lot to download support files from vendors before we got the web stuff. So an FTP client is an application that runs on a, on a computer. You can actually use a web browser as an FTP client. Just type FT, go to your web server, go to your web browser and type FTP, call on forward slash forward slash FTP.microsoft.com and you'll be connected to Microsoft's FTP server and you can download, oh, Service Pack 4 for NT Server 4.0, for example. 
There's also dedicated FTP client programs like FileZilla that you can run into this type of stuff. So the FTP server is a device that stored all the files that are being uploaded and downloaded. FTP uses two connections, uses two port numbers, 20 and 21. One is for command and control, and the other is for the actual file to be transferred back and forth. Uh, sort of a weird, uh, uh, most protocols these days only need one, one port number, but FTP was all it needs to. <clears throat> so when the FTP process is opened up with that server, we actually have two connections. We have a control connection, I call it the command and control, kind of a military term. And then the data connection is where the data actually transmits the file back and forth. And data can be downloaded from a server or uploaded to the server. Server message block is Microsoft's proprietary, well, it was based upon something they got from IBM. Um, this is the, uh, their file and print sharing protocol that allows you to, for example, log into a server and then print to that server, and the server will connect to the printer. Or log to that server and have a shared file or folder. If you work for a company, you might have your own departments or employees uh, private directory on that server you can get to. So it acts as if you, it's your own hard drive. It acts like it's your own printer, but you're really sharing with other people. <clears throat> so server message block, if I, if I, if I right-click on a folder and share it, and you copy a file from me, it's using the server message block protocol. If I print a printer, it's using the server message block protocol. Now, as data moves through the network, we have this process where application layer data is a stream of data that goes down to the transport layer. It's divided into chunks, assuming using TCP. It's numbered and sequenced. Then it goes to the internet layer. It's put in packets. Then it goes to the network access layer. It's put in an ethernet frame. And it's sent from the server client machine to the server machine. So the application layer sends the data down to the transport layer. The transport layer will divide it into the segments and add a header information. Or if it's UDP, it'll be divided into UDP data, but no connection-oriented stuff. Then the individual segments are sent down to the internet layer. He puts them in packets. Then the packets are transmitted through the network, <coughs> encapsulated in the ethernet frame. The bits corresponding to the ethernet frame are transmitted out to the device. And then uh, the MAC addresses are checked. Uh, uh, the frame the frame is converted into electrical signals that shoots out over the wire and the process is sent in the reverse. Now getting the data to the right application, this is the magic of port numbers, the transport layer. So here's the server that's running the web server application. He's running an FTP file transfer application. He's running an email application. So that server needs to know when you send a request to him, is this a web request? Is this a mail request? He'll look at that destination port number. Port 80 must be a web request. 425, you must have clicked send on the email program. Sends it to the right lines of code. <clears throat> okay, hang loose, and we're going to go to building a network. It's a network. So here's a typical small network topology. Could be a small, uh, what's this called? It's SMB, small, medium sized businesses. Home user, a lot of people work from home now. Uh, small business application where there's just a few devices. Uh, 10 to 15 is the upper limit for small network. So this, this company has got a couple of users and they have a Cisco attached telephones. They have a server and they have a connection that connects them back to their service provider, their internet service provider. Could be telephone company, could be cable company. So I wanna select devices for a small network. I need to consider, well, I could go to Fry's and buy a work group switch for $20. It won't have spanning tree protocol. It won't have, it'll be blocking. It won't be full speed. It's not manageable. It does have a console port. Or I could spend a Cisco, get a Cisco device for $500 and uh, uh, get more manageability, more features, and more speed. How many ports do I need? Well, if I've got 20 employees, 15 employees, the switches like we have in the lab, the 24 port switches, $500, they'll work fine. If I have, uh, well, at the Cisco lab, our computer science lab at the South Campus, we've got several hundred machines in one building. So we need work group switches that have 48 ports instead of 24 ports. We have a limited amount of space to put them in. What speed are they going to be? Well, 
gigabit ethernet to the desktop is pretty much a necessity these days and maybe 10 or higher gigabit speeds over fiber optic cables between the buildings all that aggregate conglomerated data is needed for this do i need an expandable device <clears throat> i'll turn the pencil <clears throat> the worker positions that we have are are not expandable they're 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 fixed with whatever whatever hardware you get when you buy it but you can buy more expensive devices that uh, have plug-in slots and we can add stuff onto them uh, cisco and other vendors network equipment is manageable they have console ports we can establish security and we can put in passwords on them that 20 dollar eight port gigabit switch you get from fries or office supply store is not manageable now let's come up with a networking scheme, an IP addressing scheme for the network. Uh, we have some end devices. We we'll probably use DHCP for them. We have servers and peripherals. We have routers and switches. We have intermediary devices that choose the best path. So let's plan out some sort of IP scheme so that uh, we can we can track the devices and troubleshoot them and control the access. Uh, redundancy is in. Um, we want to have redundancy fault tolerance is this scheme or this idea that any one wire or physical device can fail and operations do not stop. So you A plus guys, a RAID driver array. Uh, if a, a drive and a RAID array fails, we still have access to all our data. It's slightly degraded, it's slightly slower, but we don't lose all our data. So in networking, if we're going to run one fiber optic to the library, let's run two fiber optic cables. Let's run one to the library, run run to the academic classroom building next door. And if one of those gets dug up, we still have an alternate me method of sending our data back and forth. Makes the network more reliable. We don't want to pay people to sit around and drink coffee. <clears throat> so let's uh, look at our network design. Secure our servers in a centralized location. We used to have work group servers all around the campuses. They've all been moved down downtown now to our server farms, to our data center. Um, this, this would have been a problem 20 years ago because uh, the least circuits weren't that fast. But these days we have least circuits that are faster than our, our WAN is faster than the LAN. So we can put our servers anywhere. Well, let's put them all in one basket and, and have high security on that one basket. We can protect our data center downtown. We can use physical security. You have to have a card key to get in. We can use logical security, passwords and encryption and so forth. And we can create redundancy with, with extra connections so that uh, if one wire gets goes bad or one interface fails, any the idea is any one device could fail, but we still can do stuff. Maybe not quite as fast as we did before, but we can still do our business operations. In a small network, we have network aware applications that are used to communicate over the network. And then we have application layer services that actually accept that data. So for example, I'm running Microsoft Word and I'm printing up, I'm typing up a file, I'm gonna print it to the printer. Microsoft Word is a network aware application. It behaves nicely with server message blocks in the Microsoft network. The server message block protocol, application layer protocol can accept the data and begin to prepare it to go, eventually be turned into bits, shoot out the back of the machine, and those bits will just, the uh, Elvin magic, they'll show up at the printer and the printer will print my print job. So network protocols <clears throat> are the protocols that determine uh, uh, what's happening at each end of the communication session. Okay, I'm running a web server application. Uh, the web server is gonna listen to port income, coming port 80 for a web request, and he's gonna send back the proper uh, HTTP code containing the HTML formatted data back to our uh, client machine that's requested that particular information. I joke HTML stands for has too many links, but it actually means it's the format in which the data is presented. Think of a macro code for Microsoft Word. Uh, HTML code is how the appearance, it controls the appearance of the page because the web thing, this Bernard's Lee web concept was uh, no matter what kind of computer, Mac, Unix, Windows, it should look about the same on each one of them. So applications for a small network, we're looking at the infrastructure. Will it support our real-time applications like uh, uh, voice IP telephones, IP uh, telephony, uh, or streaming audio, streaming video? Uh, we need to have the uh, uh, 
processing power in our routers and switches that connect these together to make sure this works properly. Now, in a later course, we'll look at the question of prioritizing the traffic, so the QoS quality of, quality of service, so that the voice telephone circuit uh, can be put to the top of the line. It doesn't need that much bandwidth. Uh, so people are used to telephones being lousy quality, but they 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 work properly. We need you know less than a tenth of a second of delay for that to work properly. Okay, other considerations. Uh, documentation. Now, this is what I've found in my years in the business. Documentation always gets neglected. People have no idea what's running on their devices, how the wires are connected together. So you might have to bring in a, a consultant to come and check that out for you because if you, how can you fix it if you don't know how, what it was, was when it's working properly? You know, uh, how much uh, uh, we need to document the iOS and all the devices and the server configurations. Uh, device inventory, all the devices that connect to the network, the servers, the employee workstations, uh, uh, the intermediary devices like routers and switches. Budget is uh, how much are we going to spend on IT? Now, here's how you can tell if you're working at a good company or a bad company with regards to IT. Okay, when I worked for Harcourt in the 90s, the IT guy reported to the chief financial officer. Chief financial officers are smart financial guys. I joke that the people that work in human resources are the people that fail finance. The finance guys are really sharp. But they look upon everything as an expense to be reduced. They don't look at IT as uh, something that amplifies the productivity of our employees, but as, as something that has these expensive servers and we just can't afford to buy them. You can tell when you're working for a good company when the IT, the chief information officer, reports directly to the to the chief executive officer. He doesn't go through. He's up here in the conference room with the chief, the chief technology officer and the chief financial officer and the chief information security officer are all peers at the table with the chief executive officer because uh, he can bring the importance of business processes to the attention of the chief executive officer and point out that we're saving money here by amplifying the productivity of our employees. I don't think it should be called the IT department. I think it should be called the technology value center. We're bringing value to the company by using automation. Okay, rant mode off from our traffic analysis. We wanna see, we wanna examine all the things that's passing through our network. What's the traffic, kind of traffic we see? Oh, on the last business day of the month when we're running our end of month reconciliation reports, it's gonna be very heavy. What's the traffic at 4 p.m. on Friday afternoon when everyone decides I need to log on and get some work done here? What's the traffic like at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning when everybody reports and logs in? So if we have a problem with our traffic, if we haven't measured it when things are proper, how, how can we possibly measure it when things go south and we're trying to an, uh, analyze and troubleshoot without knowing what it was when it was proper? So protocol analysts can be, analysis can be used to manage our traffic. Get a free program like Wireshark. You can at least do some measurements with that. Uh, network administrators can look at what employees are doing. Microsoft, for example, the task manager in Microsoft shows what programs are running on that machine, how much CPU cycles and RAM memory they're picking up. And you can remotely uh, uh, tap into an employee's PC and, and collect this information. And so if an employee is uh, running a super duper spreadsheet for the entire financial system and he's got an older machine that's bogging down, we can use this as a justification for buying him a a uh, faster machine with more RAM memory. Yes, that's right. You have no reasonable expectation of privacy when you work at a company, just assume they can see everything that you do. So when you're in the computer lab, don't ever go to any website you wouldn't want your mama to see you going to. Okay, let's keep our network safe. Let's look at security. We have things to worry about such as um, um, theft of information. Okay, my, I joke about the Dallas Community College industrial spy is going to come over here and try to break into the dean's computer and get our secret marketing plan for the next year's curriculum. Um, we worry about information theft. It, it, uh, in a business, in a for-profit for business, that can affect your profitability and your return on your money. Uh, data loss and manipulation. Um, big problem these days with ransomware. 
uh, the, these people come in and, and get a hold of your network and uh, uh, encrypt all your data, and then everybody's screens all of a sudden pop up and say, you have to pay us a million dollars to get your data back. And by the way, if you don't pay us in a week, uh, we're going to release all this data to the public. And if you're, uh, well, we're subject to federal rules like uh, Family Privacy Act, uh, medical as HIPAA, uh, uh, commercial corporations, Sarbanes Axley Act. Plus, there's a loss of goodwill when the rest of the world finds out that you were so stupid you allowed a ransomware attack to take place on your machines. <clears throat> Identity theft. Um, give your credit card to a waitress and she takes it away for five minutes. What did she do with it when it was gone? Did she scan it on her little personal scanner and then two months later you get a $2,000 jewelry bill and you forgot where you were? And disruption of service is, well, let's uh, uh, shut everything down. Okay, we're a, a hacktivist is an activist that has a agenda. I don't like Amazon. Bezos the Beast is, is uh, wealth grew $94 billion since this uh, virus thing came, and small businesses have lost $200 billion. That's not right socially, and so I'm going to shut down Amazon on Prime Day just because uh, um, I want to do that. I have a social agenda. So we have to worry about disruption of service. <clears throat> okay, physical threats, hardware threats. Service, uh, we can have physical damage to servers, routers, switches, cabling plants, and workstations. Oh, I've read tales about uh, the maintenance men turned off the air conditioning for the whole building and the servers all overheated. Environmental threats, too hot, too cold. Or we actually had a server at Harcourt that was a uh, uh, was damaged because the fire alarm went off and it sprayed water onto the server, which was in a cube. Guess where Guess where that server got moved to? It got moved into the locked server closet real fast. The server closet has no water that can spray on things uh, like servers that are running. Uh, electrical threats. Uh, we have to use typically UPS, uh, uh, uninterruptible power supplies, to make sure that uh, our devices get full condition power because otherwise we could lose data or have electrical damage. And what about maintenance threats? Well, static electricity, you touch the wrong part with a static charge, you could damage that part and, and bring a device down. Okay, I talk about there's a couple of types of security. There's, there's physical security and there's technical security. Physical security is let's lock all our devices up in a secure closet. A secure machine room. Uh, technical security is let's use two-factor authorization. You got to put in your name and password and this little watch fob you carry around. You got to put in the secret 10-digit number that it displays for 10 seconds. So he talks about security weaknesses like technological weaknesses like you're using um, encryption but I've got a hold of your encryption key and I can get into your system. When we configure our network devices, we can configure them and make them less weak less weak for example um, password encryption service password encryption that way when i do a short run no one can look over my shoulder and see the administrative passwords and we can affect a security policy so that our employees are put on notice that they have to uh, they have to uh, uh, take security courses and become aware for example the school has been sending out fake ransomware type uh, bait messages to try to seduce the employees into clicking them. And if you click on one, they make you take a ransomware course, a 10 minute ransomware course. So if the, if the upper management is not in tune with this, this is a company that's gonna get struck by ransomware and, and, and they'll be in bad shape. Okay, viruses, malicious software is attached to another program. So if I open a dubious link in an email, it thought it came from the Chase Bank, but it really was from uh, somebody in Bolivia or something. And now it's to put a virus on my computer, which is not going to try to go over the network through a worm process and go from my desktop PC, which is attached to the college network, to other PCs and servers and, and, and get into them. A Trojan horse is a program that looks like it's something, but it's in fact an attack tool. Like there was a program, of the, the, the Dancing Baby Scheme. It was a TV show with a, the Dancing Baby video. And so they put up on the, on the, on the internet Here's a cool dancing baby video. Click on it. It's not a dance. It gives you a dancing video on the screen. In the meantime, it reformats your hard drive. <coughs> so reconnaissance attacks. When the bad, can you tell where the bad guy is in this? 
Okay, he's called an attacker. Um, malicious users, hackers, uh, threat actors. These are the guys that are from uh, trying to break into your system and install ransomware and get monetary gain. How are they going to figure out how to get into you? Well, first of all, they're going to do internet queries. Uh, Acme.com, they're going to find out what the range of public IP addresses they're assigned to. Then they're going to do ping sweeps to try to figure out where's the servers in your company. Oh, it's a Microsoft server. Those are really easy to break into. Then they're going to run port scans to, uh, to break in on your web server on port 80. And they might use packet snippers to look at your data and try to figure out, oh, he's using an unencrypted password. Now I've got access to that company's system. How about figuring out a password? A brute force attack is, I'm just going to try every possible password there is, and maybe you're using one of them. Uh, maybe I can use a Trojan horse program that goes in and pretends to be from the Chase Bank and says, um, we're tightening up our security. Please put your name and password in so we can check to make sure it works. It's not really the Chase Bank. It's someone else trying to break in. Uh, I can use packet sniffers. And if it's an unencrypted password, FTP and Telnet are unencrypted. I now know your password because you're probably lazy and use the same password every quarter. Port redirection is uh, an attack that uh, redirects your information from one machine to another. And uh, if we, we're going to see this in a more advanced course, we can we can program our system switches and routers to have trusted ports and untrusted ports to try to mitigate this problem, like a fake DHCP server. Uh, denial of service attack is what the hacktivist is going to try to do to Amazon during Prime Day. They're going to try to send a whole bunch of fake TCP sync, sync hack, hack, and send a bunch of syncs and never respond back and try to tie up all the half open channels in that server so that Amazon can't make another $98 billion for Bezos the Beast and not have a bunch of sales that day. Our best protection against anybody messing up our system, say we're, say we're going to get hit with the ransomware. They encrypted all of our programs. We don't have the most important file we need is our accounts receivable file, but everything's been encrypted. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, we have, a, we have a good backup program. We have everything on backups, offline backups, and we can just tell the ransomware guys to, to get lost and restore everything from backup, and we'll be off for a day or two. So several years ago, the San Francisco Municipal Authority they got ransomware, and they told the hackers to take a hike. They simply restored everything from backups, and for two or three days, you got free subway rides, and then they were back in service getting money. So we should have later, the latest versions of antivirus software on our PCs, make sure all our patches are updated. Windows computers are pretty good about automatically updating everything and keeping up from uh, recent attacks. Authentication, authorization, and accounting. Authentication is, who are you? Well, if you are, are who you say you are, you will know the password. There might be challenge and response questions. There could be a token card. Somehow I'm going to check you out. So when you, um, when you go to the ATM and use the ATM card, it's two-factor authentication. There's that code that's on the magnetic stripe or the chip that's on the card, and then you have to know the PIN number. You can't just go to an ATM machine without the card and say, well, here's my PIN number. Give me $500. You've got to have two things. Authorization is, well, once you've logged in with your proper name and password, what are you authorized to do? The human resources payroll clerk gets to see what everybody makes, not anybody else. When you use that ATM card, it authorizes you to get the money out of your account. And when you run out of money, you don't get any more money. And then the accounting records is, well, you took all that money out yesterday. I don't have any money left. I can go to the log file and prove this. A firewall is a device that uh, protects networks. Most companies have a firewall. And we use, um, if you ask the IT guys, they say, we can't tell you. But our board of directors approved the purchase for Palo Alto Networks. For our firewall, so we know it's Palo Alto, which is one of the best firewalls there is. A firewall is a device that keeps on their authorized traffic from coming in and keeps stuff from the inside that shouldn't skip to the outside world going back out. Your home router is a firewall. It has some basic techniques to protect people from trying to break into your system. That TCP sync, SICAC, ACK, TCP established connection, 
If someone tries to bring a fake TCP reply back into your home network, your home router will not allow it because it, it wasn't something you asked for. Endpoint security. And endpoint is the new word for we have intermediate devices and end devices and intermediate devices that router a switch, home router. An end device is a telephone or a computer or a laptop or a telephone. So if you work for a company, endpoint devices should be properly secured. And we're going to use something like antivirus software and host intrusion protection software. And curiously enough, Cisco makes all this software, and so do lots of other companies as well. So let's look at securing devices. Um, we want to secure the end devices and intermediate devices and not use, oh, by the way, when you get your CCNA and go out in business, do not use Cisco in class for the passwords on the routers and switches. Change it to something that's not the default. Who gets access to system resources? Only the people that should be working on those devices. Any unnecessary services should be turned off. If you don't need that web service on the router, disable it. And keep updated with security patches when they become available. So here's some weak passwords. They're dictionary words or they're the name and the birthday of the user. Strong passwords are not found in the dictionary. They're the combination of upper and lower case characters and numerals. So I think WebAdvisor in my TCC login has got a requirement that it be 12 characters, has to have an uppercase, has to have a lowercase, has to have a number or a special character. So it's not a dictionary word that someone can try every dictionary word trying to break in. <clears throat> so on Cisco iOS devices, we know about service password encryption. That slightly hides the passwords. Maybe we can require that passwords be at least eight characters. Maybe we can say that if you have bad uh, uh, tips, you're blocked out for, for two minutes. Uh, if you log in with a telnet or a secure shell and you walk away for lunch, well, after 10 minutes, you're logged out. So someone else can walk up, walk up and use the machine. So instead of using telnet, which is, um, if I can run Wireshark, I can see your name and password and all your data. Secure Shell is similar to Telnet. I can log into the device, but everything's going to be encrypted. So we're going to generate, a, in this case, it's using a 1,000-bit uh, public-private key pair and make up a username and a password. And then when uh, this user logs in uh, and someone runs a Wireshark on the telephone line on the pole outside the building, they won't see anything but encrypted nonsense. They won't be able to tell what it is. Now, uh, the ping message. When I type ping on a computer, ping 127.001, it pings its own address. That means that the IP code was turned on with the checkmark box. On a router or a switch, when I type ping, I get the exclamation marks. Oh, that's good. That's like reply, 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 good. Period means, oh, it timed out. No reply. That's not good. For you is the message is unreachable. There is an extended ping mode where in top, instead of typing, in this case, ping 192.168.10.1, you can type ping and press the enter key, and then it'll give you a guided response. And instead of the default of five pings, you can make it 55,000 pings. I want to stress test it. I want to make the packet size bigger. Sometimes with IP version 6, we have to specify our source address or interface to get the ping to go out the right interface port. So even if I don't have an expensive network management baselining software, I can just ping and look at the uh, time here. Time was less than one millisecond. That's pretty good, fast response. And then on another date, I type it, and oh, now it's six milliseconds. I've got much more latency delay in my system now. And that might help me with my network troubleshooting process. We can save to a text file. In hyperterminal or Terra term, we can capture the text to a notepad file, and then we can save that file and have that as part of our documentation for our network latency. Now, ping only tells you if the source and destination, destination have IP connectivity as a whole. If it fails somewhere in between, they don't know where it was. So trace route, I call ping on steroids. 
trace route pings each individual router one by one. And when the failure occurs, they'll tell you exactly where the failure has occurred. And you can run to the connection between those two routers and try to figure out what the problem is. If it's within your realm of responsibility, if it's within your company. If it's at your ISP or another company, you don't have any authority to do that. So this is the concept of problem ownership. If it's within my company and I'm the network guy, I get to fix it. If it's at another company, I don't have to fix it because I don't own the problem. There's a lot of show commands, show run, show interfaces that we can use to uh, figure out what's going on with the device, make sure the interfaces are up and up, they have a proper IP address, check show version to make sure the software, uh, what version the software is, might need to update the software. Uh, show version is particularly useful because it shows you all that stuff that pops off the top of the screen. If I'm trying to do inventory of my devices and figure out you know, what interfaces they have, how much RAM do they have, I can type show version and recover all that particular information. We have a particular lab on this on the router where you, where you collect the information about what resources are available on the router. The switch show version is similar. It shows you the processes that are capable on that switch. Now on desktop PCs, Windows PCs, I can type IP config. That's going to verify my IP address and subnet, and that's going to be called gateway. So if I'm a DHCP client, which we usually we are, uh, I can't see it in the network control panel. It just has that box click that says I've changed the IP address automatically. I can confirm with IP config. If I type IP config slash all, I can even see MAC addresses and other extra information. Uh, this command we had earlier, IP config display DNS, shows all the DNS entries that I've stored on my system in the past hour or so. ARP is our relationship between the IP address at layer three and the data link layer address at layer two of the data link layer. So the Ethernet address, this Ethernet address corresponds to this particular IP address on this particular machine. It happens to be the default gateway. All this device is used to communicate with the other networks. Okay, you guys know that I love show CDP neighbors because when you do a lab, you want to make sure that you don't accidentally configure S1 as S2 and vice versa, and now you got to start all over again. So show CDP neighbors, you can make sure that according to that page one of the lab that shows all the connections between the ports of the switches and the routers and the PCs, are they okay? Are they proper? Show CDP neighbors will show me. Well, in this case, I know that I'm R3 and I'm connected to S3 through my 00 port to the 06 port, and I'm connected to R2 from my 0001 port to his 0001 port. You can make sure these interface port numberings are proper for the lab and you don't waste time. In the case of you going into a company where no documentation exists, this is a great method to figure out where are these wires going when they vanish into the wall and go somewhere to another wiring closet. You can get CDP to show you what's going on. Very useful tool and free with Cisco iOS. Okay, my two favorite commands are show IP interface brief and show IP route. Between the two, I can usually figure out what's wrong with any lab. Show IP interface brief shows us uh, that the port numbers have been assigned to a port and these only up and up. If it's not up and up, that means layer one and layer two has a problem. If it says administratively down, that means you didn't type no shutdown on it yet. So you can make, make sure that all the IP addresses are up and up and then try to do some pink tests. Now, iOS configuration files. Like, just like the file system on a desktop PC, there's a file system in the flash drive, and there's some other file system in the NVRAM. Uh, if I type show file systems on our routers, which are 1941 routers, that's a misprint. It should say router, not route. <clears throat> the asterisk tells you that this is the default file system. So the flash memory on our routers has got, um, uh, they're about 256 meg. And after the iOS is loaded into it, it has a certain amount of free space. The NVRAM is a smaller amount of memory, but it's just the standard configuration of file. It's usually only a few hundred or a few thousand characters. So on a switch, it looks similar to this. We have our flash memory with the iOS file, and we have our simulated NVRAM, which shows us how much space that we can type. We could type a startup configuration file with 60,000 characters, and it would fit on this device. Now, this is an example, again, uh, we did the saving to a file in, in HyperTerminal. Uh, TerraTerm was what the labs were written in. TerraTerm is uh, similar to HyperTerminal, but doesn't have the scroll back bug. I can click uh, log in the TerraTerm and save my text file to a notepad file. 
and say, make a backup copy of my running configuration or my start configuration. And then I could use it later to punch the information back into the device. We can also use TFTP. Uh, we'll have a lab, a demonstration lab in the last course, the, the number four course at the end of the spring on this, but TFTP is commonly used throughout the industry for saving and loading configuration template files and operating system files to network devices like routers, switches, cable modems, things of that nature. So if I type the command copy start TFTP, I want to back up my startup configuration file to the TFTP server. If my device fails, I won't be able to get to the startup configuration file, but I've got it backed up now. It's just a text file. I've got it backed up to a server, and I can get the new device because I got hardware maintenance and put it back on it. More of the later Cisco devices got USB ports on them, so I can take a, a USB thumb drive and plug it into one of the USB ports, and I can back up to that. I can back up the iOS file. I can back up the startup configuration file and move devices from one router to another. So I can put a USB flash drive in and copy the running configuration to that USB flash name, USB flash colon zero, and save it. So um, what's the three most important duties of a system administrator? Have a working backup, have a working backup, have a working backup. If you can't reproduce the accounts receivable file, you better make sure your resume is up to date because you're going to be one that's blamed. Even though you made that budget request for a RAID driver array and backup software and they turned it down, but when it fails, all of a sudden it's a big deal and you're the scapegoat. A multifunction device, integrated service router. Your home router is an integrated service router. It's got a, a, a switch function, it's got a router function, it's got a firewall function, it's got a Wi Fi function. Um, I guess you guys know that Cisco bought Linksys about 10 years ago. So uh, that's why you got the little Cisco logo here on the thing. Uh, so um, Cisco makes managed devices that are also more expensive than a $50 for a Linksys router. Most routers have got a Wi Fi mode, a wireless mode. When you set up your home router, you're going to make up a service set identifier. That's the name that you see when you. Uh, 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 connect the client machine like a laptop machine to it, and you can select a wireless channel. Some of the newer devices are real good about looking at the existing Wi-Fi traffic in your neighborhood and trying to pick a pick, uh, most least commonly used channel that uh, won't be so much collisions between. So in wireless, we want to change the default values. We want to disable SSID broadcasting and configure, oh, web. Oh, that's bad. Wireless encryption protocol. I'll call it weak encryption protocol. No one should use WEP. It can be broken in 10 seconds. You should use WPA, some protected from WPA with lots of bits. So it's more secure, more difficult to break into. Most devices these days don't even have WEP in them anymore. So here's a trick when you get a new home router, um, plug it into the Ethernet connection a wired Ethernet connection uh, from your desktop PC, your laptop PC, plug it straight in one of those four LAN ports on the back of the device. The device will automatically get an IP address, and you'll go to the management address for that router. It's typically 192.168.1.1. Most of the time, it could be 192.168.0.1. A telephone company is backwards from everybody else. They're 192.168.1.254. And then you can go in and set your passwords and set your Wi-Fi passwords and set your uh, SSID and so forth. Then once you got it properly configured, then you attempt to connect your actual wireless devices. So go into the wireless mode, configure the SSID, configure what channel you want, and then turn in any kind of security encryption you want. Not WEP, but WPA would be better. Then you can go to your wireless clients and look for that SSID, type in the security code that you set up, the password that you set up, and then you'll be able to connect to that particular device. So this shows an example of a, <clears throat> for a laptop computer, the slot, the PCMCIA slot that's in the side of the device, you can plug in this uh, card and do it. Most laptops have integrated Wi-Fi in it for about 20 years now. Okay, all right then, let me see. Let me stop sharing that. 
Okay, guys, uh, this is our last lecture. It's over now, and I've turned on all the tests. Uh, just to note, you must take the course feedback form before you can take the final exam on the Nanocad site. That is a Cisco business rule. Uh, so finish up. Most of you guys are pretty well caught up with your labs. Finish up your labs. I do drop the lowest lab grade. Uh, take those chapter exams, not chapter one, but chapter two through 11, those 10 chapter exams in the final exam, and that's 50% of your grade, and then your labs will be 50% of your grade. And the final exam period will start Wednesday morning, this Wednesday, and it will end a week from Wednesday at five in the afternoon. And then on a day or two after that, you'll be able to see your grades pop up in my TCC Blackboard and the Web Advisor. Okay, I'm gonna hang loose for a second in case anyone's got any problems or questions, and then I'll see you guys on the run around next time we come up. Uh, uh, Log in for the, uh, go to WebAdvisor if you want to get your CCNA and sign up for a CCNA 3 course. I'll be offering it on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 o'clock at the South Campus, and there's other campuses that offer it as well.